Hello. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Virtual Institute, number um, number ten. This is the uh, this is uh, the celebration of one decade of Virtual Institute tastings in numbers, not in years. Uh, my name is Moss Shirkogel. I am the uh, the perennial host um, who keeps coming back for these tastings. Nobody really knows, uh, including myself, why they keep inviting me back, but I do keep coming back, and I have yet more delicious and wonderful wine to talk to you about tonight, uh, directly from all over a Soyuz wine country. I have three fantastic wines from three fantastic producers to discuss tonight, but uh, but first of all, I just I just want to put a lampshade on the fact that I am. Uh, today, recording this live stream in my garage uh, of the house that I just moved into. Um, I'm surrounded by packing boxes, but I've uh, tried to mask that as well as possible. Uh, last, uh, last week, we had a very professional live stream with an actual producer, producer Andrew, who got everything set up for us. But producer Andrew has a paid job to do today. So... Uh, for whatever reason, that takes precedence over the job that he did for me, purely on the nature of goodwill. And uh, his wife doesn't drink, and he's not a fan of wine, so there honestly wasn't too much that I could offer him in exchange. So that means that today I am without a producer, I am self-producing, I am here in my garage in beautiful Brentwood Bay. Not really much to look at, uh, but uh, trust me, it's very nice here. I mean, actually, it's, it's really smoky, so it's not super nice uh, here right now, but it's like that everywhere, so, <laughs> you know, no worse off. So today, I want to talk to you about port wines, uh, or rather, we should say port-style wines, uh, because port is one of those terms, like champagne, uh, like uh, Amarone, which is protected by geography. Right, uh, you know, people people know the idea that champagne wines uh, are specifically sparkling wines of a particular type that are produced in the Champagne region of France. You can only call it uh, champagne if it's from that one area, and uh, and the same with Amarone, which is a, a a dried grape wine that comes just from a particular region in Italy. Uh, now here we are talking about port, which is probably the most uh, uh, nationally integral of any of these protected geography wines. Uh, I mean, certainly when you think about French wine, Champagne floats up to the top of mind pretty early on, but people also think Bordeaux and they, they think uh, Loire Valley and Burgundy and all these other things. But uh, when we're talking about port, it is so inherently tied to the nation of Portugal that, um, well, I mean, it's right there in the name. The name is literally just Portugal. Uh, so port wines are uh, something that technically can only come from within Portugal, specifically northern Portugal. There's, the, there's this uh, region called the, the Douro, uh, and, uh, and the Douro region of Portugal in the north is where port wine comes from. And it is incredibly important to the culture, uh, and it, it is something that has kind of made its way into every aspect of, uh, of, of life in Douro. Uh, port is ubiquitous. It's, uh, it's omnipresent. Um, they have very specific uh, boats that their entire purpose is just to uh, row barrels of port from one location to another. Uh, they even have a name that I can't remember, uh, which is specifically a port transport ship, um, which is, which is uh, you know, kind of wild. But um, obviously we are not in Portugal, uh, we are in Oliver and the Soyuz, and so we're going to be talking about what technically should be called port-style wines. That's how you get around it. You say port-style to indicate that, okay, this is like port, but of course we're not in port. There's actually a Canadian custom uh, which, which was brokered with an agreement uh, uh, together with the, the government or the regulating body of Portugal, that um, sometimes we are allowed to call our uh, port-style wines tawnies. We can just say tawny. 
this is a tawny, that's a tawny, and that means port, and this is kind of a, an agreement between Canadians and Portuguese that they say, okay, we'll give that a pass. You're allowed to say tawny, but you just can't say port. But most, most Canadian producers will say port style, or they will say something like, well, one of the things that we have here. Let me introduce you to the three wines that we're going to be tasting through tonight. We are going to start with uh, Adega on 45th. Their, uh, I don't know if you can see that, it's a, it's, it's a little small right there. Their, uh, their Porto. Uh, it is the Porto di Adega, uh, or da Adega. Um, the Porto de Adega. And so Porto with, a, with sort of the A-O, you know, it's, a, it's, it's the Portuguese way of, of, of writing port. Uh, and, uh, and it's kind of a little bit of a backdoor workaround, you know, you're not allowed to call it port, but what if you called it port in a different language? Well, th then it's kind of permissible. The next one that we're going to be looking at is going to be the uh, Quinta Ferreira, which also uh, kind of uses the same idea, and this is the, uh, the, the Porta, the Porta de Oro there, uh, the, uh, the, the sort of port of gold. And, uh, and again, we put the A on the end so that we kind of circumvent the naming conventions. And finally, we have the Vin Amite uh, uh, five-year aged port. This is a brand new release and uh, they at least, um, you know, give it a different name, uh, but that's probably because they're French influenced as opposed to uh, Portuguese influenced like the other ones. And they call theirs uh, Ouest, which is the French word for West. Again, kind of identifying where they are and where it's coming from. So let me explain port as a basic concept before we actually start tasting. Port is uh, uh, better referred to technically as fortified wine. It is called fortified wine because it is wine that has been reinforced and fortified by, um, by uh, uh, spiking it with liquor. <laughs> and, uh, and so really what you, uh, what you have is a, a base wine that is created uh, and that is starting its fermentation and then part of the way through the fermentation you hit it with some kind of uh, um, uh, spirit okay you, uh, you you take a you take a, a highly distilled liquor much more uh, high alcohol content than wine would normally be and you bam you spike the wine with it and what that does is it brings the alcohol content of the wine spontaneously up so high, it kills the yeast. So we have to understand basic fermentation right here. When you start with, with your juice, you add in yeast, you've got sugar. The sugar starts to be burned off by the yeast and turned into alcohol. So you've got the sugar levels lowering and the alcohol levels rising. But yeast can only go so far. Common strains of yeast can only go to about 15% alcohol until that's toxic to them and the yeast actually dies. And then if you have a little bit of sweetness left, well, you're left with it. This can happen in very hot years when, uh, when you have tons and tons of sugar and you can only get it to a certain level before the yeast stops. Now, when you're making a fortified wine, you are willfully pressing that button and you are causing the alcohol level to suddenly shoot through the roof when you still have a buffer of sweetness left. It's a, it's, it's a vital distinction that, uh, that port is a fortified wine, but it's also defined as a sweet fortified wine. You can have sweeter and less sweet, but you always have that chunk of sweetness hasn't burned all off yet. When you're pressing close to the 15, all of a sudden, bam, you shoot it through the roof, all the yeast dies, and whatever sweetness you had to begin with is left there. That is not burned off. And so that's how you get a high level of alcohol and a good level of sweetness. Normally, for conventional table wine, you would have to choose between sweetness and low alcohol or low sweetness and high alcohol. With port, you get it all. It's sweet and it's full of alcohol. It's very high alcohol content. Let me just quickly check the, uh, the, the alcohol levels here. We've got 20.8%. Uh, That's the Adega. That's almost 21% alcohol. We've got, um, what is the, 19.5 uh, on the, uh, the Quinta Ferreira. And the, uh, the, the west here is 19.2. So, uh, so, so a couple in the sort of 19 and a half range, and then one in the 20 and a half range. Pardon me just one second. I just need to, uh, to check a little message right here. I'm just going to... Sorry about that. Uh, I've, uh, I've just been notified that apparently the, uh, the, the video is backwards. Um, 
I don't know how to fix that. So, uh, so that's really unfortunate that, uh, that I have so many words <laughs> in this, uh, in this uh, 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 live stream right now. Uh, you know, I could have worn any shirt. Uh, I could have put anything behind me, but instead we've just got words, 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 words. This says Inkamy, by the way. I'm sure it, it looks like a, like a Pim uh, Kim to you, but uh, but this is an Inkamy shirt. I decided to put so many words on, so uh, so sorry about that. Uh, sorry that the stream is backwards. This is why I need a producer who doesn't need a career. This is why I need to work with somebody who doesn't need any alternative source of income other than the occasional bottle of wine that I throw him that he is not interested in. Uh, anyways, forgive me for the uh, for, for the reversal. Um, anyways, back to port. There are several different types of port that uh, that you might be familiar with. If you're a fan of port, or, or even if you've just bought one or two bottles in your life, you've probably seen some of these terms. Let me just slide these off. Wait a minute. Why am I showing you words? They're backwards. You can't read them anyways. Okay, well, let me, let, let me, these are basic words. So maybe you can actually interpret this even backwards. Uh, Y-B-U-R uh, spells ruby. Ruby is your basic port, okay? This, 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 this is a pretty simple style of port. It's red, hence the name ruby. Uh, it tends to be made in, uh, in Portugal in either stainless steel tanks or in concrete so that you don't have too much oxidization. When, uh, when you are keeping a wine preserved in stainless steel, you preserve its color, you preserve its freshness, and, and sort of a, a crisp, bright fruit flavor. So you get juicy fruit flavors from ruby port um, that, uh, that tend to have high levels of color. They're bright, they're vibrant looking but they don't necessarily age uh, with any real interest. Uh, it tends to be that, that most ruby ports, when you buy them, they're as good now as they're gonna be in five years. You can kind of drink it whenever you want and you're, you're gonna get that experience. Now the next step is tawny port, T-A-W-N-Y. I feel like I need to spell it since it's all backwards. Uh, tawny port is uh, a barrel aged port. Effectively, it is, it is a ruby port that is instead put into oak barrels for some period of time. The, uh, the minimum amount of time that you need to age tawny port for is three years. Uh, and, then, uh, and then from that point, you, uh, you, you, know, you can age it for incrementally higher amounts of time, but once you get to sort of seven years, that's when it becomes reserve tawny port. That's, that's when you kind of hit the special level, and then they will mark uh, uh, particularly aged tawny ports with different, uh, different decades. They'll say 10 year port, they'll say 20, 30, 40 even. You can have ports that are aged for 40 years uh, before release. And what you get from this is a change in color. You can immediately recognize visually the difference between a ruby port and a tawny port because the ruby looks bright, it looks ruby. And tawny, I mean, the, the term literally means kind of this brown, right? Uh, and so you get more of that brick red oxidized color and you also get flavors to go with it. You get nuttiness and you get uh, a sort of caramelization uh, uh, often. You get this, uh, this, this hint of sort of nutty sweetness. White port is a thing. Uh, it's, a, it's still a relatively, it, it, it isn't a category of port that has been as well explored, let me just say, as ruby and tawny, which have so many subcategories. I'm not going to bother getting into them. Uh, but white is really, you know, you get the white and then you get the reserve white uh, that's, that's had a little bit of oak age. And, uh, and so white port is, is, is quite neat and it's quite tasty, but, uh, but it's something that uh, people have not been exploring in the same depth as Ruby and Tawny, uh, at least not for as long. So it's kind of, a, you know, an exciting new uh, uh, type of port that people are playing around with. Uh, as well, I haven't listed here rosé. They do make rosé ports. Uh, which is similar to white in that it's, it's a bit of a shallower pool. There's less of it being made and there's less variation and distinction. But, uh, but you know, again, delicious wines that are made in kind of a rosé style by exposing, um, you know, red wine grapes to less contact with their skins so that you don't get quite as much uh, uh, tannin and, uh, and density to them. Finally, we have what's uh, distinguished as vintage port. Vintage port is, uh, is something very specific. It is a, a, a port, kind of in almost the ruby style, that has been given a little bit of oak, 
uh, not full on tawny level of oak, so that's why I say ruby style. You give it maximum two, two and a half years. Uh, a vintage port could be less than that, but no more than two and a half years in barrel. Then you stick it in the bottle and you keep it in the bottle for decades. The idea behind vintage port is that you take a particularly fine year, you, you, you date stamp it. Uh, a lot of port is non-vintaged, uh, which we say NV. If you ever see NV on a bottle of wine, any wine, uh, particularly port or sparkling wines, NV means non-vintaged. And what it can mean is that, uh, is that it's maybe a mixture of multiple years. They've taken several years and they've blended them together uh, for balance. But when you get one standout incredible year, that's your vintage year. And that's when you make something like vintage port. You put the year right on it, 1997. And then you do, you know, your two and a half years tops of, of barrel age. Then you throw it into the bottle and you keep it there. And it tends to be that vintage port is, is able to last for decades. You keep it around for years and years and years. The, the, the eldest vintage port that, um, you know, within the last decade was still available for sale was coming out of the early 1800s. And you could still buy this stuff. Uh, and that's, you know, that's what you get with the vintage port. You get something that is designed for the long haul, as opposed to your base ruby, which is, which is designed for, you know, more immediate consumption. Your tawny, which is sort of medium term, you know, you can, you can drink it after a decade, certainly, maybe more than that, but, uh, but not to the same degree as vintage port. So, here, we are going to explore three different port mm -hmm. wines today, and technically all of them would fit under the definition of tawny, because they have all received some oak. And, uh, and yet you could argue that maybe some of them would be classified as vintage because they've been given some amount of oak and a lot of these are designed for, for long age, uh, long, uh, long shelf lives. And, uh, and so you get some, you get some very interesting um, and um, uh, how to say it, uh, innovative creativeness in terms of the sort of new world styles of making these wines. Sure, they're using the basic fundamentals of fortification, but, uh, but for one thing, everybody has to explore different types of grapes because what you would make Portuguese port out of would be, um, well, I mean, there, there's, there's dozens and dozens of different grapes that you can use, but there's kind of five big ones. And the only ones that we've heard of as, as British Columbia residents or Canadians or whatnot is um, a Tariga Nacional, which we know just because Moon Cursor grows it, good on you Moon Cursor, and uh, a Tempranillo, uh, which we know from places like uh, Inniskillen, good on you Inniskillen. But, uh, but barely anybody grows these grapes, Tariga Nacional or, uh, or uh, Tempranillo, uh, certainly not the other three that I'm not even going to tell you the names because they don't exist here. And uh, you basically don't see them really making their way into port production because they, they just don't take well to BC climates in the same way that they would in Portuguese climates. So instead, we adapt, we change what we're doing, and, uh, and you see certain trends. Two of these wines are made out of Merlot, the, uh, the Adega and the Quinta Ferreira. And then the, uh, and then the Vinanite is made out of uh, a Cab Sauve, uh, Syrah and Cab Franc. Okay, so these are grapes that we know and that we love in Oliver and Asoyuz. And, uh, and this sort of echoes this idea of taking a grape like Merlot and using it as the, uh, as the flagship that can, be, uh, that can be turned into this different style of wine. So this is something that I, I, would, I would define as truly Canadian. Now, let's, uh, let's go ahead and get, to get started. I'm just going to put my glass right there with the old uh, Oliver Soyuz Wine Country logo. Um, fortunately, you can't see it. I say fortunately because uh, uh, Jennifer, the director of the Winery Association, would, uh, would kill me if she knew that I was using a glass with the outdated logo. This is the new logo. This is what you should look for. It's a circle with a circle in it. This is, we're not talking about this logo anymore. Uh, so I'm going to start with the Adega. By the way, you see that, that, that I'm, not, um, I'm not having to uncork these right now. And it's because a, a lot of port does very well breathing, opening up. So I opened all of these yesterday. Port wines, because of the fortification levels, because of the high level of, uh, of alcohol, means that, that they, can, um, they can handle uh, being open for a longer period of time than your standard table wine. 
you still don't want to to uh, you know keep them open for years or anything but uh, but you know a lot of uh, tawny uh, ports that have been aged in barrel for uh, for a few years they can probably stand to be open for a couple of months which means that you can open up just a little bottle like this a little 375 mil bottle and uh, and you know you can have a little bit after dinner or you can have a little bit as an aperitif you know a, a, a little uh, a little um, uh, kind of pre-dinner uh, warm up basically and you can you can stretch it over weeks and weeks you don't need to have some every night and you don't need to have full glasses of it because I will remind you that we are starting with the Adega which is 20 point is it, I don't want to say 0.5 if it's not 0.5 uh, 20.8 oh that's higher than five it's 20.8 percent alcohol <laughs> this stuff is wild I want to I want to um, uh, give a shout out to Adega for also still being in my awareness the um, the current record holder for highest alcohol level in a standard table wine achieved purely through ripeness of the grapes in 2015 they produced a cab franc that uh, that oh it's starting to get fuzzy in my memory it was 17 percent alcohol it was something maybe 17.2 percent alcohol uh, I think and uh, and they did that just purely by how insanely ripe their grapes were because a dega is in a soyuz uh if you are not familiar with a dega they are on 45th uh, uh street it says they're right in the name they are called a dega on 45th the state winery uh if you don't know where 45th street is you could be forgiven i didn't know that a soyuz had 44 other streets uh but um they are right next to Incomeep cellars uh, if you're uh, if you're crossing the bridge, you're heading east towards Rock Creek, and uh, and you turn off before you hit the mountain, uh, you'll have Adega and then Incomeep both on the same road as each other, and Moon Cursor is just immediately up behind them. For a while there, we were hosting a big event before the Half Corked Marathon uh, called the, uh, the the Primavera Party. We we move it around every couple of years, and for a while there, for a few years, we had it shared between Adega and moon cursor which was fantastic people were able to come to adega taste wine and then walk right up through their vineyards and into moon cursor's vineyards and go right to uh, to, to moon cursor for dinner so uh, so you know we've got some some cozy little neighbors we've got a little triptych a little triad of wineries right there on the east bench of a soyuz and because they are on the east side of a soyuz it means that they get full sun they get to, they get afternoon sun as the sun is setting it is blazing right down on all the adega vineyards that are just <laughs> uh, you know poised like solar panels directly into the hottest sun that we get in british columbia and in the bowl of a soyuz where the mountains create a, a amphitheater that just bounces and radiates heat shines it back down you've got dry sandy soil that again absorbs that heat and just keeps spilling it back up all night long absorbing the heat and then and then radiating it out so that the grapes stay hot even at night this is how you get wines that that go to 17 percent without any manipulation or or 20 and a half percent if you give a little a little bit of a a, a spike there uh, incredibly rich well-rounded wonderful wines they make at adega and they are uh you know they are they are the right people to be making a port style wine because they're they're very portuguese uh they're they're extremely portuguese uh they uh it's um it's fred and alex and uh, and their wives it's fred fred and uh and maria our brother and sister fred F uh, uh, farina i always think dennis farina uh classic character actor sadly passed away now um but uh, but fred and maria farina um, and uh, and their uh, wife and husband, respectively, uh, Pamela and Alex, are uh, are the two families that uh, that together run this winery, and uh, and uh, Fred and Alex in particular are very familiar sites at all these events, and uh, everybody, all, all four of them, really charming, really lovely individuals, very modest, um, you know, sort of a little bit low key about uh, about uh, the winery that they make and uh, and they have no right to be modest because they have made uh, some really incredible amazing wines that uh, that i have featured many times at uh, at my wine school um i think that we've already talked about the uh, the the manuel 
which is a wonderful unoaked red, which is just so incredibly singular. But as well, it is so incredibly distinct from a wine like this, the uh, the, the the Porto here, uh, which is so rich and so bold. I, I mean, I'm, I'm telling you that I haven't haven't actually tasted it in front of you. Like like I said, I opened these yesterday, so I've had some of all of these wines already. But um, let's uh, let's let's do the tasting here. Hmm. Okay, so once again, whenever we're tasting, I, I, you know, I always go over this just in case you haven't watched another one of these videos. You always do a swirl. You always want to oxidize the wine. You want to allow it to open up, right? The more you swirl, the more air you're putting into that wine, the more you are allowing uh, aromatics to escape. Because actually what, what you're encouraging the wine to do is start evaporating. You're, you're, you're coating the walls of the glass in a thin layer of wine the alcohol inside there is going to start evaporating. Alcohol evaporates at a very, at a very uh, kind of ready point. It, 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 it's not hard to make alcohol evaporate. And as the alcohol is evaporating, it's carrying with it um, aromatics, smell. Uh, it's, it's why alcohol is used as a, as a catalyst for things like perfumes, because it is, it is excellent at conveying aroma. So the more that you do this swirling, the more that you are allowing that evaporation, which means that you're going to get stronger wafts of smell coming out of it. But as well, you are allowing the wine to access oxygen that it's been deprived of. The reason that I opened these yesterday is because I wanted them to start breathing. These wines have been sealed away. They've been kept hermetically sealed so that they do not have uh, much exposure to oxygen. And, uh, and so we are letting them breathe for the first time, and that's going to start changing things. It's going to start breaking the wines down. Now, like I said, with port, they break down a lot slower. It might take a few months for these to go to the point where you don't want to drink them anymore. But, um, but if you give them a little bit of a head start, you know, open them for a day. Have a little bit on the first day you open it, but then try it again day two. It's, it's going to be all that much better. All right, so what do we get here? We get... We get cherry, we get dark cherry, and, uh, and cocoa, you get this chocolatey smell. This, was, uh, this, this wine was made out of Merlot, like I, uh, like I mentioned before. So, so you get some of that dark fruit. You get uh, cherry and plum. These are, these are sort of typical Merlot tones that, uh, that you're seeing come through in this wine. It was given four years in neutral oak barrels. So that's, uh, so that's more than the minimum of what would be required to make a, a, a Portuguese tawny port, uh, and, and longer than what you would do to make a vintage port, but um, nobody really adheres to the, to, to the methods of vintage port. A little bit more uh, uh, oak age is, is usually more in line with what people are looking for here. Mm. I want to point out quickly, just as I'm smelling this, that, uh, that Adega, they also make a white port. I have, the, uh, I have the red here because I kind of wanted everything to be in line. I wanted three red ports, uh, ruby or tawny or whatnot, but um, they also make a, a white port. This is, this is the second year that they've been doing that. So if you are a fan of port, then you got to go check out the, uh, the, the no, what do they call it? It's the Porto de Adega um, Bronco. Uh, not, not Bronco like, like you know, um, but like Branco, like, uh, like Portuguese white. Mm. Oh, wow. Well. Mm. I love port. I really like port. And it just warms your belly. I mean, there, there's a reason why for, for hundreds of years, people is good for your health as a, as a medicinal remedy, right? That, uh, that oh, you've got gout? Have some port. I mean, it was, it was very commonly used as a remedy for gout, which is a really bad idea because drinking alcohol exacerbates gout and makes it worse. But, uh, but you know, what a way to go, right? It, uh, it feels so rich and so warm. It's so engaging. It's so enticing. And this is, this is a smooth port. This is, this is a really well-rounded port. Uh, 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 again, giving it a day of age just just makes all of these wines even softer, even more approachable. But this was this was easy to step into even on day one. Uh, it has these these warm, 
ripe tones of, of, yeah, more dark cherry. I'm getting more of that dark cherry. I'm getting a bit of clove in this, right? I'm getting some of that fun baking spice. A little bit of cinnamon, a little bit of clove. There's, a, there's, there's obviously some heat from the alcohol, but uh, despite the fact that this is the most alcoholic of the bunch, almost 21%, it does not taste boozy. It does not taste overwhelming. There's no burn, right? Uh, it's, it's just warm and, and lush and, uh, and, and very bright and fruit forward too. Mm. That's delicious. Uh, Bronco, one of my favorite jokes from the show Arrested Development. The main character goes to a Ford dealership and he says, I want to buy a car. And the guy says, okay, what were you thinking? He says, oh, what about a, what about a Bronco? What about a Ford Bronco? And the dealer says, oh, we don't make the Bronco anymore. Uh, you know, with the whole O.J. Simpson trial escaping in the white Ford Bronco, we wanted to distance ourselves from that kind of fugitive mentality. And the main character says, okay, well, well what do you sell now in its place? And he says, oh, it's called The Escape. It's a good joke. So, <laughs> the, uh, the, the Adega port... Uh, obviously already, uh, with one sip, 21%, I'm, I'm, I'm immediately drunk and telling, you know, telling jokes from, uh, from, from sitcoms from 15 years ago, but, um, it, it's a really lovely wine and, uh, and you can see immediately why, uh, why port is something that has become so significant and important to Portugal as a whole, because there is something so... Uh, incredibly delightful about this method of winemaking, this style of wine. There's something very authentic about it, and there's something very hearty and very filling. And, uh, I mean, I could drink this every day, right? Not every wine will I say that about, but I could have a little bit of port every single day. And this is exactly the sort of port that I would choose to have. Mm. Fantastic. Once again, that is the uh, the Porto de Adega. Uh, this was um, th it's uh, is this one non vintaged? Yeah. This is uh, this is non vintaged. Um, they they started doing it um, you know, back in two thousand nine. Um, but uh, but again, four years in neutral oak. You can kind of assume maybe released last year. So uh, so. Um, maybe this is from 2015 or 2014. Um, again, it's not necessarily common to put vintages on port, so so oftentimes you do not see that, which leaves you guessing a little bit as to when it came from. But uh, but as well, many wineries will do kind of a, a a system where they pull a bit of wine from the previous year, they add it to the next to kind of balance and round that out, and so you wind up getting something that is a mixture of different vintages. I know that Alex is a is 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 a fantastic, very comfortable winemaker uh, who uh, who's very intuitive and makes things with ease. And so uh, and so, I'm I'm sure that uh, that um, you know whatever this is, whatever it was a combination of, of multiple years or just one year, um, he was just feeling his way through it and, and picking out whatever whatever seemed best. And uh, I agree with the result. So, Adega. The, uh, the, the, the Porto there, that is $25, by the way, uh, which is an absolute steal for a wine of that caliber. Uh, $25. It is almost one point of alcohol for every dollar that you spend on it, which I mean, you literally cannot do better than that. And, uh, and I highly recommend it. All right, wine number two. We have Quinta Ferreira. Now, again, I know you cannot read their name because it's backwards, but uh, Quinta Ferreira, this is the, uh, the, the Porta de Oro. This is the, uh, the, the Porta de Oro, and this is, this is a fun one. I, I guess I, it's, it's very hard for me to convey colors here, but uh, I don't know if you can see that the, uh, the, the Adega, the last dregs of the Adega, uh, it, it has a nice ruby color to it. There's a, there, there's a nice coloration there. And then the Quinta Ferreira has a proper tawny tone. This is a tawny-looking wine. Nah, you can't see. Eh. One of these days, 
uh, I'm going to get a, a, a kitchen cam. You know, when they do cooking shows and they have a camera overhead that, uh, that aims down at the countertop. I need to get one of those so that I can tilt this over a white surface and have you look down on my wine. I mean, the alternative is that you just buy these wines and then you tilt the wine and look at it yourself. Which one's going to cost me more money? <laughs> so this is a wine from 2012. They have vintage this. This is, uh, this is 2012. And so this has been given, this has been given a good long time. This was three years in neutral oak barrels. Okay, three years in neutral oak barrels. So let's say 2012, 2015, it was maybe, uh, it was maybe bottled. And so that implies that, uh, that five years have passed and, uh, and this has been aging in the bottle for that period of time. That means that this is probably the closest to a, I know I'm blocking with the bottles and it's backwards, so I don't need to gesture at the whiteboard, do I? The, uh, the uh, Quinta Ferreira Porto de Oro is probably the closest thing to a vintage port that we're going to be trying here today because it falls closest to the, uh, to the oak cellaring uh, duration and it's been designed for long age and has been given more age than the others, which means that with this one, we are going to see more of the aged characteristics. If you're looking for the, 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 the brighter, more fruit, uh, uh, immediate wines, um, the other two are going to scratch that itch a little bit better. This one is going to give you a sense of aged character. So once again, this is this is from Quinta Ferreira, uh, and I said that Adega was very Portuguese, that the owners are very Portuguese. I mean, it's not a contest, but if it was a contest, Quinta Ferreira would be a very strong contender for the number one spot of most Portuguese winery in Oliver and Soyuz. I mean, the name Quinta Ferreira, I mean, Fer Ferreira is the last name of the uh, of of the founders uh, uh, of uh, of John and Maria Ferreira, uh, husband and wife that uh, that started the winery um, back in uh, uh, two thousand seven. Two thousand seven, yes. Planted grapes in nineteen ninety nine. Came over from Portugal. Each of them with their with their families. Uh, so 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 born in Portugal, and uh, started planting orchard fruit in um, in the seventies. Uh, uh, late 70s and then uh, farmed for 20 years and then ripped up the uh, the orchard fruit and planted grapevines uh, right at the turn of the new century 1999 year of the matrix uh, and uh, and so they planted their their vineyards at that time and then 2007 uh, some somewhere around then I think I think it was 2007 uh, started up the winery anyways um, the Ferreras started this, but Ferrera also has a significance, a, a history in port. I told you that the oldest vintage port that you could buy within the last decade was from the early 1800s, and, uh, and it was from a producer called Ferrera. So Ferrera is this legendary name in port production. And what's the first word in the winery? Quinta. Quinta in Portuguese means five or fifth, something like that, but, but that's actually not what they're aiming at. Uh, a quinta is a term that's used to describe an estate, a, a port-producing location up in the Douro region of Portugal. So the quinta system is a system to evaluate where you can grow port and to name basically your estates or your houses, your properties, where good port can come from. So when they say Quinta Ferreira, uh, that right there, it, you know, calling their winery that right from the beginning is basically a challenge. It's basically saying, port, here we come, right? They're, they're destined for port production. And so this right here, this is, this is a very appropriate wine to have in this lineup. We would be remiss if we did a study of port and we didn't include Quinta Ferreira. Another great family winery, you've got, uh, you've got John and, uh, and, and Maria and uh, their three children um, that, uh, that are all involved in, uh, in, in the winery in, uh, in various ways, so kind of the entire family. So this right here, Immediately, right on the nose, you get uh, you get much more nuttiness 
than uh, than uh, you see in the uh, in the adega. The adega is that big bold ripe fruit. This is coming through as uh, as you're getting almond. You're getting kind of a, a, a toasted walnut, right? You've got this uh, this again this this oxidative note. If you know how to detect. Uh, uh, oxidized wine, right? This is something that uh, that you see coming up, this nuttiness. But also, like I mentioned before, did I say caramel? I think I said caramel. You get this, this sweetness. You get this kind of sticky toffee tone right there. Hmm. When you're tasting wine, I don't always recommend this when I'm teaching classes in person, but <clears throat> if you want to get a little extra oomph from the wine, you can, uh, you can open your mouth and you can draw a little bit of air in, and that just kind of bubbles the, uh, the, 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 uh, the wine as you're holding it in your tongue. You kind of pool your tongue, cup it, you have a little bit of wine there, and then you just draw a bit of air across the surface. Try not to have so much wine in your mouth that you choke yourself. Uh, and, and also try not to tilt your head down so that it all spills out your mouth. This is why I don't teach it in person. It's very embarrassing to, uh, to, to learn. But since you're at the safety of your home, you can try this. Take a, take a sip, open your mouth, and then just draw a little bit of air in. And what it does is it just uh, fans the flames, it amplifies the flavor, and you get a little, a little extra hit of, uh, of, of taste, of, uh, of, of content. So once again... Definitely the nuttiness is coming through, but you also get cherry. Um, you get uh, you get some real sweetness. Uh, it is Merlot, again, just like the Adega. And so you see that cherry, you see that plum, perhaps. Mm. But yeah, it has this, this fantastic... <clears throat> um, kind of toastiness that's in there as well and the sweetness seems pronounced the sweetness is 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 a little stronger right the adega very full fruit this one has a little bit more of a stickier tone almost almost a, a little bit of molasses in there mm. It's a great tragedy that we are doing this tasting right now because last week was the final week that uh, Quinta Ferreira had their food truck on site. So I I'm afraid I cannot tell you to go to the food truck there uh, uh, right now, but I can tell you to go there next year when the food truck is back because, uh, because the tacos they had, amazing. Just, just wonderful. Beautiful place to go sit just outside of Oliver. Quinta Ferreira is immediately east of, uh, of the town of Oliver. Uh, you, you cross the bridge. Once again, both of these are bridge crossers. You cross the bridge, you start heading out towards the east side of, uh, of um, Oliver, and then, and then you turn just immediately south and you find Quinta Ferreira there. Beautiful property, kind of, kind of you know, looks out over, over the valley of Oliver. And a wonderful place to enjoy a bite to eat and, uh, and a nice glass of wine. Mm. Wonderful. <laughs> One of the reasons why I wanted to have this lineup is so that I could show you the difference between the, the, the sort of aged characters. You have your, your, your newer wines like, uh, like your Adega, which is, I mean, it's not even necessarily new. It's still been around for half a decade, but, uh, but, but doesn't have the same level of bottle age, which means that, uh, that it's showing completely different characteristics. And this is showing you a bit more like what the Ruby Port would be like and then here, the, uh, the Quinta Ferreira is showing you what the, uh, the, the aged characteristics would be like in, in more of a vintage port right there, even though both of them technically fall into the category of Tawny. So we're kind of, we're mixing a lot of things together. I, uh, I, I, I will bring in the, um, the Adega White Port at some other time because that's a, that's, that's a whole other cup of tea to talk about. But it's time for us to move on to the third and final uh, tasting of the evening, this is the West, uh, which I have to say with that little head flourish because it's French. And uh, it is, uh, it is uh, once again, the French word for West. Um, this is from Vin Amite, 
which is a magnificent little producer that is immediately on the road between Oliver and De Soyuz. They're just on the east side of the highway, uh, uh, just north of the excellent winery intersection. And, uh, and Vin Amite is another true family producer. Uh, it, is, it is, you know, mother, father, grape growers, and then, uh, and then eldest daughter, uh, winemaker. And, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a family operation where everybody kind of participates and they provide such a wonderful and um, uh, uh, inviting experience. They, they provide such, a, such, such sort of um, warmth and coziness when you go to see them. A lot of people uh, know them well for the charcuterie plates that uh, that they usually put together. Obviously, in uh, in in you know the environment that we're in right now this year, um, food service is not really viable. But they have they have uh, pack up and go uh, kind of picnic uh, charcuterie packages that you can buy. So you can go to the winery, you can have a tasting, you can pick up a, a, a bottle of wine, and then you can get some of these delicious meats and, and unpasteurized cheeses, some really fantastic stuff uh, to go and, uh, and kind of go enjoy that uh, in your own safe little bubble. So, uh, so Vin Amite, we've already talked about them in the Gamay Noir um, uh, episode of this, uh, of this series right here, so I'm not going to go into too much depth about their winery, but, uh, but they have been working on the West for a long time they uh they tucked aside five barrels of wine okay they were they were they were producing their uh, their their port style wine they set aside five barrels they left it for three years at the end of the three years they brought out one barrel they moved one barrel forward this was in 2018 so I guess we can, we, can, we can do a little bit of reverse math and we can say that it was probably the 2015 vintage that, uh, that they captured, put into barrel, kept that for three years, 16, 17, 18, and in 2018, they pulled it out. It could have been the 2014 vintage, depending on kind of how we're measuring time here, but 14 or 15. And, uh, and so they make the port, they save it for three years, and then once it's at the minimum requirement for tawny port, three years, they bring out one barrel, but it's only one barrel. One barrel gives you somewhere about maybe 50 cases of wine, okay? 50 cases of wine, perhaps. Not even always that. And so they bring that out, they sell it, sells like hotcakes, wonderful wine, and then they sit for another two years. And now in 2020, they have pulled out two barrels. And so the West is back, and now it's a five-year port. Okay, they had their three-year, now they've got their five-year, this only made about 80 or 90 cases of, uh, of, of wine, not even the full 100. Uh, and so you've got to get it before it's gone. And, uh, and then, once it is gone, they're just going to wait another couple years. Uh, I think they've implied that maybe they'll, maybe they'll go towards uh, 7. I don't know, you'll have to ask them specifically. But, uh, but once you get to 7, then you hit... The, 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 the Portuguese standard for what would be a reserve tawny port, seven years in barrel. And at that point, you can get, you know, the, the last one or two barrels as they release them. But as well, they've been introducing new barrels. They say they'll put maybe one barrel a year away in the cellar to, uh, to, to kind of start appreciating for, for the future so that they can continue having the port as it goes and so they've got this little kind of staggered system they take a barrel out they put a barrel in they take a barrel out they put a barrel in so it's a very fun uh, you know kind of story behind it it's neat to think of how incredibly finite it is right how little of this wine there is to go around and uh, it is absolutely worth the, uh, the, the, the kind of wait in anticipation <sighs> I was uh, I was tasting these last night with my uh, with my wife, and uh, and she likes port uh, uh, as well, so she was very excited about this, and uh, and so you know we're tasting through the wines, and then we finish off with the Vin Amite, and she was just smelling it and smelling it and smelling it, and uh, and and I said you know what's uh, what's up, and she just said it smells so neat, you know she she doesn't uh, she's not a 
trained wine scholar. She does not have the words that I have. But she said it was very neat. And she just kept saying that. It's neat. It's really neat. She really liked the smell. There was something about the smell that, uh, that she found absolutely fascinating and compelling. And it wasn't quite like anything else that, uh, that she had tried. And uh, I would attribute that to the fact that this is a, this is a three varietal blend. This is Cab Sauve, Cab Franc, and Syrah. And so uh, already on their own, those three grapes together would make a really neat wine. They would make something that was full of, of, of character and nuance that would have a lot of interesting distinctions and, and, and sort of interbalancing flavors. You know, the, the, the Syrah bringing in pepper, the Cab Franc, the Cab Sauve bringing in maybe, uh, maybe uh, a different type, maybe a vegetative pepper, maybe a, maybe a bit of green capsicum or red bell pepper. The, uh, the, the Cab Sauve maybe bringing in some gravelly tones, right? And, uh, and different elements of fruit, red fruit from the Cab Franc, uh, dark berry from the Syrah, uh, all these different elements, all mixing together. And then you take that, you, uh, you fortify it with an alcohol that's made out of their own Cab Sauve that's been distilled. A lot, of, a lot of wineries, what they'll do is they'll take their grapes, they'll separate off a little bit of the fruit, uh, uh, quite frankly, you take your, your garbage fruit, your rubbish fruit, the stuff that you don't want to turn into pure wine, and you take that and you send it up to, uh, to a distillery. There's a, there's a distillery called Maple Leaf that does a lot of work for, for wineries. And, uh, and so you send your grapes up to a distillery, they distill it for you, boom, until you've got a spirit, a grape spirit. And then they ship that back to you. You have to have a very special license to have spirits in your winery. It's, it's a totally different category. You have to have special containment, place to put it that is separate from the wine. But then you have your spirits and then you use that to fortify your wine. And, and it's all internal, right? So the nice thing about the Vinamite here is that all of this is made from their own grapes. Even the, uh, the, the you know, the, uh, the, the spirits. Mmm. That's beautiful. It's super, it's super mellow. It, it, it's, it's, it's probably, of the three, this is probably the, the, the softest, you know, kind of the kindest, the most gentle. It, uh, it has such uh, warmth, but uh, it, it isn't light. I mean, you have, to, you have to understand when I say soft, I don't mean uh, toothless. It's still a, it's still a forceful it's still an impactful wine, but uh, but it just has no rough edges. And again, for a wine that's over nineteen percent alcohol, that is a really amazing thing to say that it does not bite at all as it goes down. So it's it's a beautiful, beautiful, well rounded wine. You even get a little tiny bit of um, of acid. I mean, not much. I mean, none of these really speak to acid there. They're kind of tannin and alcohol and, and, and fruit characteristics and sweetness. And so any of those things kind of burn out any, any essence of acid, but you can always taste if there's acid because you get that little hint of freshness, that little bit of brightness. And so you have this little hint of brightness and I, and I suspect it would probably come from the Cab Franc uh, because the Cab Franc tends to be the highest acid of those three grapes, but Syrah can have some acid too. And again, it can be a little bit deceptive. You don't realize that there's the acid there in the Syrah. So you get a little tiny hint of acidity to give a little bit of vigor, a little bit of zing. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't taste acidic, not at all. I'm, I'm, I'm detecting it mostly for its, its um, side effects as opposed to the taste of acid. But it's a really, it's a really pleasant wine to drink. Mm. That's wonderful. That's, that's so good. <laughs> I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to put it down. Mm. This one. Uh, this one. Once again, you can get it uh, from the winery. You pretty much only get it from the winery. It is. Uh, it is uh, so incredibly exclusive. There is just not much ever made, and uh, and it is fast to go, um, especially in a year like this where 
we've been seeing BC wineries, we've been seeing some some fantastic pickup in terms of online sales. We we all really appreciate everybody ordering things online, getting things direct from the wineries. It uh, it means that uh, that that we were all able to keep in business, and uh, and a lot of us were really amazed to see that we had. Marches or Aprils or Mays that uh, that wound up actually surpassing expectation, because nobody was visiting in person, but everybody was ordering, and uh, and so uh, once again, thank you everybody for for patronizing BC Wine. If you're watching this stream, then I assume that you are a patron of of BC Wine, because why else would this be interesting at all? I'm a guy in my garage drinking wine in front of you, uh, but um, thank you for uh, for for watching, and for patronizing us. And uh, not not in that way, but in the good way. Um, also, thank you for patronizing me. Um, but uh, anyways, all I mean to say is that you should probably buy this wine fast <laughs> because it's not going to be around long because uh, because people are going to buy it. And that's that's only appropriate. All right, I'm going to uh, I'm going to wrap up. I think I've uh, I've. Um, communally imbibed about 60% alcohol here. I know that's not actually how math works. Uh, I've done my serving at right ticket, but uh, but still starting to kind of lose my ability to do math. So, uh, so it's probably best to take off before I tell any other jokes from Arrested Development. Uh, so thank you everybody for watching here tonight. Thank you for learning a little bit about port style wines with us. There are many other wineries in the Oliver Asoyas region that make port wines. So I could have done a lineup of 10 of these things. It didn't need to just be these three. Um, you know, this is just all I give myself time for. So you absolutely should go out and examine what wines you can find. Check out the different types of fortified wines. They are a really welcome addition to any dessert wine uh, kind of category. Dessert wine is not just late harvests and ice wines. Absolutely, you should bring some fortified wine the next time you're doing a big tasting and, uh, and uh, you are uh, having some friends over and you all have a common theme. You know, you're saying, oh, everybody bring a Germanic white or everybody bring a Pinot Noir, everybody bring a dessert wine. If that ever comes up, bring a port. Definitely bring a port because it balances things. It has sweetness, but it is not overwhelming sweetness. I said that I could drink port every night, and I mean it. I could not, however, drink ice wine every night, or even late harvest every night, because I'm just, I just don't have much of a, of a sweet tooth. I crack out ice wine maybe once every few months for a special occasion. I enjoy it a lot, and then, you know, I'm, I'm good for another couple months. But port, there's something about the balance of the alcohol, the tannin, that texture, and all that dark fruit together with a little bit of sweetness means that it just doesn't overwhelm me. So, so really, really lovely wines in terms of general style and also in these three examples. Uh, I would also like to thank my wife for setting up my, uh, my stage today. She plugged in a lamp and it exploded. The, uh, the, the cord blasted off of the plug. It, uh, it lit a small fire and it also knocked out the internet to the building about a half an hour before I needed to start this stream. Uh, and then we were able to reset the breaker and get everything back going. So thank you for, uh, for the, uh, the, the effort and also for helping to put it all back together after you lit the internet on fire in my home. Thank you everybody for watching. And uh, um, we will see you all uh, again in a couple of weeks to talk about Bordeaux style reds. Cheers.